Today I'll be talking about the science of games and floating. And I'll leave it at that. Monopoly, Minecraft, Dungeons and Dragons, Go, Poker, Legend of Zelda, Cards Against Humanity, Operation, Twister, even Tag. How can all of these wildly varying activities belong to the same broad category? Games provide us with a seemingly inexhaustible amount of entertainment, but have you ever stopped to think about what a game actually is? What is a game? Sports, board games, tabletop RPG, video games, LARPing, all of these belong in the same category. What could they possibly have in common? I've been thinking about this a lot over the past nine months or so. About nine months ago, I got introduced to a man named C.T. Nguyen, not personally. I would love to meet him someday, though. Uh, C.T. Nguyen is a philosopher of games. And yes, that is a real thing. Nguyen describes games as art forms of agency. What does this mean exactly? Games shape our choices. They shape the things that we can do within a specific environment. If we're playing chess, it's the board we're playing on, the pieces we have, and the rules of the game. If we're playing a video game, it's the environment that we find ourselves in, the character that we're playing, the objectives we have to achieve. It shapes our agency. It shapes our choices so that we can accomplish something. Sometimes that's an outcome. With something like the lottery, you're pretty much playing to win. There's not really much of a game involved. You're just trying to get to a specific outcome. But it can also engineer an experience. Twister's a really interesting example of this, right? You're not really playing Twister to win. Or I guess some people could play Twister to win. But the, the game is about putting your hands on different colors so that you're creating this strange experience where you're intertangled with your friends and you all collapse on each other. The point is the experience. You, you are trying to win while you play the game, but it's about crafting an experience. And then some games were doing both. For many sports, the objective is to win, and you're trying to fight against someone else, but you're also trying to get exercise. You're also trying to have an experience, do something fun. Games allow us to facilitate these varied objectives by shaping choice itself. Okay, now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I bet you you're all wondering, Flux has been talking about flotation in the immune system for the past five years. <laughs> Why is he here talking to us about games, about how to play games and how games are structured? Well, to figure that out, we're gonna have to have a little bit of what they call on TikTok story time. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about where I've been for the past year because uh, it's taken me to some really interesting directions. Um, so last year, right before the last float conference, I finally finished my PhD. So, woo, yes. <laughs> I officially became Dr. Flux, uh, and, and it was over. I had done uh, my five years of my uh, research. I did my year-long clinical internship in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, and I was finished. And I had these kind of paths before me that were kind of low-hanging fruit. Um, I could become an academic, I could become a researcher, I could continue along the academic system, or I could go along the path of a clinical career. I could become a therapist, or I could do some combination of the two. And as I really started to think about it, neither of these options appealed to me. Um, I really like doing research, and I love answering those tough questions, but the academic system was not really a place where I wanted to stick around. 
um, being a clinician was incredibly meaningful. Um, being able to help people was something that over the five years that I acted as a therapist was so, it helped me to grow, um, it helped me to learn, um, but I also realized that it took a lot out of me. Um, and for my own mental health, my own personal well-being, I realized that doing that for a living uh, would not really be something that was sustainable for me. Um, and so I really started to think about what I wanted to do next. And I explored a lot of different career options. Um, but the thing that I think perhaps is obvious to anyone who knows me that I've always been super passionate about is communication. Um, I want to create things. I want to communicate. I want to talk about things. I want to write things that help people, that help improve the world, that make a difference. And so I started thinking about what could I talk about? What could I do that I'm pretty good at that would have broad appeal um, that would work? And one of the things that came up very early on in my thoughts about different topics and things that I could communicate about was psychedelics. So psychedelics for me, uh, I have a history with them. My graduate school career was in novel therapeutics. I worked in a variety of different novel therapies, uh, including a collaboration with MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Uh, I've been in this world for a while. Uh, in addition, I worked as a uh, consultant for the company Cybin, which is a psychedelics company. I worked with them for about a year and a half. Um, I also have an extensive understanding and uh, presentation history with neuropharmacology, uh, talking about how different drugs affect the brain. Um, I've had several talks on this, this uh, topic in particular. Um, and over the time that I've been around psychedelics and worked in this field, I've really come to believe that they have a role and can play a role uh, in our general wellness. Um, but the thing was is that I realized that while I have an extensive scientific understanding and knowledge about psychedelics, um, I didn't really have a connection to the communities on the ground right now that are working to proliferate, popularize, le legislate, legalize across this country. Um, and I knew that if I was going to decide to dive into this world to start making content, I was really going to have to get to know those communities. Um, I was going to have to understand where they were coming from. And I was going to have to understand what they needed. Um, because. I don't want to just make content without it being relevant. I want to do things that people are going to use. Um, so I traveled over the past year, and I made friends, and I joined online communities. Um, I went to Los Angeles uh, and met psychedelics practitioners there and talked to people in the community. I went to the Bay Area up in San Francisco, uh, met some amazing ketamine-assisted psychotherapists, got involved with those communities. Um, I went to New York City. I reconnected with one of my old Cybin uh, colleagues who uh, has innovated a protocol for psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, I went to the DC area and to Baltimore and I got to know some of the communities there that have been on the ground, uh, that have been working on this. And I heard so many incredible stories of transformation. Um, so many amazing uh, pieces of information and anecdotes about the transformational process that accompanies psychedelics, psychedelic assisted therapy, and that world. And I got exposed to the dark side, uh, to the underground um, of psychedelics. And that I wasn't really prepared for. I got exposed to ethical abuse. A lot of people having really negative experiences, bad trips and quite a bit of severe negative mental health impacts. Now, this is not the whole story. Um, and I don't want to say this as if I'm saying that psychedelics are not helpful or we shouldn't be pursuing this. I'm saying it because I wasn't really prepared for seeing the downsides and seeing the potential pitfalls that we're going to have to figure out a way around to be able to move forward. And so I became very connected to ethics. Uh, as I got deeper and deeper into this, I started realizing that we need to be solid on our ethical principles. We need to be able to think about how to ethically work with psychedelics to prevent some of the harm that I was hearing about from happening. Um, in April of 2022, uh, I spoke uh, at the NYU Symposium on Psychedelic Justice, which was an amazing one-day symposium that looked at all of this stuff. Um, I gave a talk about the ethics of sex in psychedelic healing that was very well received. Uh, there were many other talks about uh, 
bringing in more indigenous voices, about paying attention to the way that we structure psychedelic therapy, about behaving in ways that are as ethical as possible. And through that, I also got connected with people at the state of Colorado. So some of you may be aware that last year, the state of Colorado passed the Natural Medicine Health Act of 2022, which is a framework that allows for the legalization of psilocybin therapy, specifically for treatment-resistant depression and PTSD, and it also uh, creates a decriminalization framework uh, more broadly. Um, and I started working, uh, well, I started talking to and attending uh, and having conversations with the people who are on the task force and who've created many of the subcommittees that are exploring how to do this in a way that benefits the state of Colorado and that is able to provide the most assistance and help while also minimizing the potential harm that could be coming from this implementation. And a major theme started to come up around this work. And it's a theme that I really started to connect with personally, um, and that is harm reduction. The idea of how do we take things that have amazing benefits, but also have the potential to be misused or the potential to go south in certain circumstances, and how can we minimize harm? How can we come up with frameworks that allow us to take potentially volatile, but therapies that have such high potential for positive influences and outcomes and create a system around them that allows us to reduce harm? So I had discussions with the Colorado task forces. Um, and then in parallel to that, I also started working on the ground in harm reduction. There is an after hours underground club called Void in Philadelphia um, that brought me on as their harm reduction specialist. Uh, so uh, two to four times a month uh, on a Saturday, I stay up really late <laughs> um, from, uh, my shift is usually from midnight to 7 a.m. Uh, and I'm on hands to help people who are potentially having negative experiences and also to provide assistance to minimize harm that could be occurring from drug use, including psychedelics and other drugs. Um, it's been amazingly rewarding. I have been able to help to spread behaviors that limit uh, overdoses. I have been able to help individuals who are having negative drug experiences or bad trips to stay present, to breathe and to move through the difficult times that they're going through. All of this really made me think about how can I contribute in a way that creates a harm reduction system that can assist as psychedelics become popularized across our country. This is a map of active legislature and where laws have been passed. And as we can see, there are many states that either have things in process or considering laws to legalize, decriminalize um, different aspects of psychedelics and psychedelic therapy. Um, and I want to make sure that we have a system to work in tandem with that, that helps to limit any potential harm that might come from this. So I thought about a lot of the negative experiences that I've heard and that I've experienced, um, firsthand or secondhand, um, in these communities. A lot of times, difficulties with psychedelics come when people don't pay attention to their mindset, when people don't think about where their mind is when they use a psychedelic substance. And psychedelics are incredibly dependent on your mindset. They start with where you start. And so if you start in a negative place, it's very possible that you might have a negative experience. The other is setting. Uh, I have heard many, many experiences from people that have had bad trips or difficult lack of safety from people who were not paying attention to the setting that they were in when they were using psychedelics. Also, manipulation. Who are you with? What are they trying to do? Do you have the same goals with using these substances? And not necessarily thinking about the mental health history of the person involved trying to do clinical work without a guide, uh, using psychedelics with a history of something like schizophrenia. Um, there are many risks and many things that people don't always take into account when they're using psychedelics. And, you know, I realized that the war on drugs didn't work. Just say no doesn't work. We need systems that give people the power to be able to reduce harm on their own. The genie's not going back in the bottle. 
we're not turning back time in terms of psychedelics. They're getting proliferated. They're going out into this country. We need a method that helps to reduce harm and also helps to facilitate positive experiences. And so I thought, and I thought, and I thought, how would we do this? And I came up with a system. That system makes use of the philosophy of games. It uses gaming mechanics, but it doesn't create a game. It creates a system, a protocol. And as I developed it, I realized that it's not really just a protocol for psychedelics, because it's not just about reducing harm. It's about shaping a positive experience. And it could really be used for any altered states of consciousness. I call the system Journey Space. Journey Space is an aesthetic striving experience. In the terminology of the philosophy of games, an aesthetic striving game is a game that is designed to produce a specific experience. It is designed to produce a specific aesthetic, a quality of experience. And that is what I designed the system to do, is to produce a striving experience, produce an aesthetic of a positive altered state of consciousness. Within this system, it starts out with something similar to a character sheet. There are four different paths that an individual can take. They can take a path of creation, a path of transformation, a path of discovery, or a path of connection. Each of these different paths come with their own very brief objective. For creation, it's to create something new, for transformation, it's to transform something stagnant. For discovery, it's to discover something hidden. And for connection, it's to connect in a new way. In the philosophy of games, these are called pre-losery goals. They are an objective that someone follows within a game, but the actual objective of the game is the experience that is being created itself. So holding on to a goal that you're going for while knowing that the experience is actually what you're aiming for. To use the Twister example, the pre-loser goal of Twister is to win the game by putting your hand on the right colors or your leg on the right or foot on the right colors. But the actual experience, the aesthetic striving experience, is what you're going for with the game of Twister. And in this case, these pre-loser goals help to facilitate a positive experience of altered consciousness. Then each of these the four paths are broken down into three different journeys, uh, making 12 journeys in all. These journeys are based off of the 12 young anarchetypes because that seemed to fit the best. Um, I modified them slightly to fit with general reasons why people seek altered states of consciousness. Um, and each piece, from the architect to the explorer to the jester, has a very brief description of kind of what a person is trying to accomplish or go for. And then we have the system itself. The system is a brief 10-step protocol. I've tried to make it as short as possible, um, but each of these steps is designed through gaming mechanics to facilitate a specific aspect that is necessary when a person is going through an altered state of consciousness. The first two are about intention. They're about picking your journey and setting an intention that goes along with that journey and committing to it and being able to take that as your guidepost for what's happening next. Steps three and four are about safety. It is about creating an experience and a space where you're going to be safe, where things will, you'll have minimal interruptions, you won't have to make many decisions. Steps five and six are about acceptance. Um, it's about recognizing that sometimes, especially in altered states of consciousness, depending on the substance or depending on the protocol or what you're doing, there may th be things that are uncomfortable. You may experience things that are scary, but that it's okay. And that as long as you are coming at this from a position of safety, it's going to maximize your chances of being safe. And recognizing that acceptance is one way to be able to facilitate that experience. Step seven is about surrender. It's about surrendering to the process itself, letting go and allowing it to happen. 
Step eight, following the experience, is about gratitude. And then steps nine and 10 are about integration. Taking the experience, taking what happened, and integrating it, both on a personal level, through personal reflection, and with someone that you trust in the community. It's very important to have access to context, um, particularly in psychedelics, when having experiences that may be very disorienting, that may be difficult to understand or integrate from, it's helpful to bring someone else in for that context to help ground you. And that's it. 10 steps uh, that facilitate these six things through gaming mechanics. And I have copies that I'd love to share and get feedback on. This is the beta version. Uh, I have just developed this. It has not been extensively tested. Um, my goal with this is to facilitate positive experiences while reducing harm. And I want to know if it actually works. Um, I also think that it is interesting because it can be applied to floating. Floating is not an experience like psychedelics, usually. Sometimes I've had some floats like that. Um, but in generally, it is an experience in which you go into a state, and that state then brings you into a state of mind that is different than what most people are used to. And we can think about it as a journey. And for some people, particularly people that might be overly anxious, uh, individuals who are kind of unsure about what they're doing, um, or maybe even people who are experienced but are looking for uh, a deeper, deeper path, a way to structure what they're going through, this could potentially provide them with a journey framework, a way to turn a floating experience into a catalyst for change, a catalyst for experiencing something meaningful to the individual. So that is where I'm at with this. Uh, I'm really excited about it. I've been working on it for the past six months. Um, and I would really love to get other people's takes on it. Um, is this something you think would work in floating? Is this something you don't think would work in floating? Which is fine. You could tell me that. <laughs> I can take it. Um, I am looking for ways to use this to help facilitate altered states of consciousness, whether that is in a drum circle, holotropic breath work, using a substance, floating, or anything else. Um, and I want to see if it works. Uh, and so this is me bringing it out there uh, and inviting you to take a look at it, see if it's something that you think could be applied, and give me feedback, because uh, I'm really interested. Um, if you'd like to reach me directly, if you don't get a chance to talk to me today, my email address is fluxphd at gmail.com. Um, and I would love to have conversations about this for the rest of the uh, conference. Um, so find me, and, uh, and we can chat. Uh, but anyway, thank you for listening, uh, and uh, I'll see you all later. Thank you.